When rising DJ Valentina Trespalacios set her eyes on John Poulos, she believed she had found an older man brimming with confidence and maturity. But perhaps a wolf in sheep's clothing is the name more fitting. Unknown to her at the time, John was already married, had been abusive towards his former wife, and had even left the family high and dry to begin a new life with younger women. And if that wasn't enough, the man was also a fan of Andrew Tate. Sadly, she would never learn of his true colours, because John would change her life in the most brutal of ways. That being, he would end it. So, who is John Poulos? What happened between him and Valentina? And how would all of this come to an end? Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the case of Valentina Trespalacios. Valentina was a successful DJ in the country of Colombia. Unfortunately, she paired up with a man named John Poulos. And let me tell you, this guy will leave you extremely angry. This is your friendly reminder that I post true crime and darkly fascinating stories here, and in the coming months, I'll be doing new types of content too. So if you're interested, please consider subscribing to stay tuned. Anyway, with all of that out the way, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Valentina Trespalacios. Welcome to Colombia, folks. This South American gem is renowned for its breathtaking rainforests, pristine white sandy beaches, and of course, its deep-rooted love affair with coffee. Now, Colombia takes its coffee production to a whole new level, boasting some of the most cherished blends worldwide, with the iconic Supremo, Huila, and Excelso beans leading the pack. But what makes Colombian coffee truly special is its uniqueness. Influenced by factors like the latitude and longitude of the cultivation site, the acidity of the soil, and even the water used for irrigation. I know I say this on my own bag, but each blend really does tell a unique tale of its origin. Here's a fascinating tidbit, but did you know that coffee begins its journey as a vibrant red cherry? The beans which are nestled inside start as pale green before transforming through the intricate roasting process. And depending on whether you like a dark roast or a light roast, the length of time in which you roast the coffee beans will give you a different type of flavour profile. If you like your coffee dark and chocolatey and caramelised, then opt for a dark roast. Whereas, if you prefer vibrant and fruity notes, then go for a light roast. It feels like, especially in the winter months, coffee is deeply appreciated by everyone. But of course, especially just after Christmas, we are all trying to watch our money. And so, with that in mind, here is a gift from me to you. If you're in the market for a bag of coffee, then check out my own brand, Classified Coffee, and save 50% off your first subscription. Just use the code SAVE50 at checkout. Now it's no surprise that I absolutely adore coffee to no end, and I love to see people drinking it from all over the world. And so next time you're drinking your own cup of coffee, why not send me a picture on social media? And that doesn't mean it has to be classified coffee either, because honestly, I just love being part of your coffee and chill moment. So, please tag me. Anyway, that's enough about coffee. Straight back to the video. Beyond its signature beverage, Colombia pulsates with vibrant energy, hosting numerous festivals and fiestas annually. These celebrations are a riot of colours featuring lively costumes, exuberant dances, and rhythmic music. And of course, let's not forget the copious amounts of rum that always seem to flow freely here. So, whether you're here for the coffee, the festivals, or the nightlife, Colombia welcomes you with open arms and promises an unforgettable experience. Now, no Colombian celebration is complete without music. In Bogota, which is the country's sprawling and high-altitude capital, the party and club scenes are a dominant force that help shape the local culture. And one of those individuals who contributed to the city's nightlife was the talented 22-year-old Valentina Trespalacios. Valentina was born on December the 16th, 2001, which, come to think of it, makes me feel rather old now. Anyway, Valentina was born to her parents, Giovanni Trespalacios and Laura Hidalgo, and she would grow up in Bogota with her parents and her older brother, Daniel. 
During her childhood, her parents would unfortunately split up, and she and her brother would stay with their mother while their father stepped out of the family picture. Over the following years, Valentina grew up as her mother formed new relationships, this eventually leading to two younger siblings, a brother and a sister. Valentina and her brother Daniel absolutely adored their mother, and as they got older, they realized how much she struggled to raise four children. As a single mother, it was solely up to her to financially cope for the entire family family, and this often meant she had to work multiple jobs at a time to feed her kids. Valentina and Daniel eventually stepped up to help raise the family, and this made them extremely hardworking and ambitious young adults. In fact, they'd even planned to help their mother buy a house. Quite aware that she was becoming a very beautiful young woman, Valentina planned to work as a model or in the entertainment industry most preferably music. Her passion for music and clubbing started quite early at the age of 15. Now, in Colombia, gaining access to clubs is hardly regulated, so she found no problem making her way inside. I think the magic seems to wear off as we get older, but in those younger years, most of us want to go clubbing, or at least I did. Back then, life just seemed to be easier. We could go out for several drinks, stay up until 3am, and then go to bed and wake up absolutely fine. But now, I'd wake up with a terrible hangover, ringing in my ears, and probably amnesia. So it's no surprise really that now I opt for coffee instead of heavy drinking in late nights. It just makes the next morning so much easier. Anyway, it was during one of those nights out that Valentina met a man named Pablo Silva. Pablo was an entrepreneur living in the local area. After a few drinks and some light conversation, he encouraged Valentina to learn how to become a DJ. You see, DJing was one of many passions that she had seemed to pick up from the clubbing scene. Valentina and Pablo would keep in regular contact throughout the following months. Fast forward two years into 2019, and at the age of 17, Valentina passed her course and officially became a certified DJ. Shortly after this, Pablo took it upon himself to to start managing her. He had many contacts in the industry, and was able to land her several gigs and performances. Possibly quite predictably though, this relationship would not stay professional for long, and eventually, the two became romantically involved with one another. Over the next few years, Valentina rocketed throughout the ranks to become well known in Colombia's clubbing scene. Of course, all of this with the support of her boyfriend, Pablo. But all so-called good things must eventually come to an end, and after their third year together, the pair decided to split up. Despite their breakup though, Pablo continued to professionally manage Valentina. The man still loved her, and wanted to see her thrive, so I suppose you could say that they did split up on good terms. Being outgoing and genuinely friendly, Valentina found it quite easy to network with other creators, this of course aiding in her rising popularity throughout the years. Moving forward, she would often perform at clubs in Colombian cities such as Bogota and Medellin. In other words, she was quite literally living her dream life. By the year 2022, Valentina had grown to become a young woman with a very successful career. And throughout all of this, she remained both honest and committed to her promises, using the money that she earned to help support her mother and family. It was noted that she often treated her and the kids to cinema trips, new clothes, and good food. Following her breakup with Pablo, Valentina was now single and ready to test the waters again. Despite the fun, she missed having a genuine connection with someone, and so she began to date. As mentioned before, she was amiable and had no trouble in meeting new people. And just a few months later, she found herself a new partner, that being a 34-year-old man from Texas named John Poulos. Their passionate discussions developed quite rapidly, and after only several days of talking, the two decided to meet in person. Valentina had formally been invited to a festival which was located in Mexico, and with this being between both of their countries, they decided to meet there over the weekend. Neither of them would have to travel too far for this, one up from Colombia and the other down from Texas. Now despite the language barrier, their meeting went incredibly well. John admired her beauty, talent, and charm, and although she was 13 years younger than he was, she was incredibly mature for her age. And although her career was in the nightlife industry, she took her job extremely seriously. She avoided drinking on the job, and steered clear of the industry's drug scene. Now the pair seemed to hit it off quite tremendously, so much so that they extended their holiday by more than two days in Mexico. 
of course, all expenses paid by John. So, it's quite evident that Valentina was a well-established individual. But who is this John Pulos guy? And what made him fall for a young DJ in Colombia? Well, unfortunately, he was bad news. Valentina knew that he was a man in his 30s living in Texas, but what she didn't know is that he was actually a recently divorced father of three young children. John had been married to Ashley Poulos until she filed for divorce in January of 2022, with everything being finalized three months later in April. They were married in 2009, and as Ashley puts it, had three beautiful children together. However, their marriage was littered with sadness. In 2018, one of their sons would be diagnosed with cancer, leaving the family absolutely broken. The stress of looking after three children, one being gravely sick, seemed to change something in John. He had always been on the aggressive side, but now it didn't take long for him to become abusive against Ashley, this rightfully resulting in her filing for divorce. He would not stop there, however, because before the divorce was finalized, John transferred their entire marital estate to an offshore trust, leaving his family with nothing. I mean, the man even refused to pay child support for his three children after this. John's Twitter profile, which is still up to this day under the username ptrain67, mostly talked about stocks and American politics. But saying that, there was a more controversial side to him too. On November the 27th, 2022, he retweeted Andrew Tate's post saying, Most of you men aren't even living life. You're barely existing. Then you die, following the footsteps of your parents and everyone around you. I've shown you the alternative path. You have a chance. And remember what I said about him leaving his family high and dry? Well, when someone asked for marriage advice on Twitter, John replied with, prenup and offshore trust. Now, we'll get back to his Twitter profile again shortly, but this guy talks so much shit about stocks. Honestly, it was a real effort not to fall asleep listening to all this gibberish. Having left his family with nothing and now back on the dating scene, John could shower his newfound long-distance lover with gifts and trips abroad. And although she appreciated all of the presents, she had no idea of their immoral backstory. The pair would continue to communicate long distance, meeting up in various countries for vacations together. And eventually, John would travel to Colombia to take things even further by meeting her family. The entire family seemed to love him, and although he couldn't speak Spanish very well, it was obvious that the meeting went swimmingly. Valentina's mother was particularly fond of John. She found him to be very charming and polite, and most importantly, she could see that he was head over heels for her daughter. It's fair to assume that, as an older man, he had a wiser head on his shoulders. From the outside, John seemed to support her career, and when expressed her desire to get minor plastic surgery, he even encouraged her and paid for her procedures. After all, he felt quite special having a young and successful woman around. Simultaneously, Valentina would often boast about her new boyfriend to her friends. She would often describe him as a kind and generous gringo, and fantasized about their plans to go to her dream destination, Europe. But as time passed by and their relationship progressed, Valentina's social status would continue to rocket. She was becoming increasingly popular around the city, and with this popularity, her friendship circle continued to forever expand to new people, and much to John's dismay, this included various men in the process. With her relationship with John often being long distance, John developed a rather deep insecurity about their situation, and he would continuously worry that she was falling around with other men while he was out away. I mean, it is no surprise that she received a lot of attention from the opposite sex, and as you can probably predict, this did not bode well with John. He knew that she was younger and way more attractive than him, and with this being a new relationship, he was not confident that she would stick around. John steadily became more possessive over the months, insisting that she video call him every time she went to an event, and if he ever caught on that she was with another man, he would be pissed. Now, this behavior should alarm anyone in a relationship. It is not up to you who your partner does or does not hang out with, and it's not like she had any control over this either. This was her job. But Valentina's family were not alarmed by his behavior. They merely thought that he was jealous because he loved her deeply and didn't want to lose her. 
They even went as far to call him protective. However, by December of 2022, Valentina was getting to the end of her rope with his possessive nature. They seemed to argue pretty much daily, and she could clearly feel his controlling grip on her. Over the weeks, his behavior became more and more concerning, and I can clearly see why Valentina was put off by this. I mean, it moved past a trusting man plagued with concern to an obsessive stalker trying to catch his partner out. Valentina reached her breaking point when he aggressively accused her of getting physical with another man. Now, this in itself wasn't new, but he would further back up his claims by claiming that he had hired a private investigator to follow her, and he allegedly reported back to John to confirm that she was cheating on him. As a result, Valentina tried to break off the relationship. Although she had no way of knowing whether John was telling the truth or not, he had deeply betrayed her and her privacy. The news angered her, and in her temper, she insisted that John's private investigator was wrong. Realizing that his desperation had led him to overstep the line, John backtracked and tried to calm her down. He would further try to convince her not to leave him, and miraculously, it seemed to work. In fact, he had already made the huge decision to relocate from Texas to Columbia in order to prove his love for her. Or maybe perhaps it was to keep a closer eye on her whereabouts. The desperate man also insisted that this would end his insecurity, as now he could come back to her every night. And the icing on the cake, he confessed that he wanted to marry her and start a family of their own. Swooned by his deep confessions, Valentina took him back almost immediately. Their valid arguments over his very concerning attitude turned into discussions of marriage and moving in together instead. It was around this time that John would also make his most viral post on Twitter. When asked what was your craziest first date, he replied, invited a Colombian woman on vacation without meeting her first. Now, we're getting married. This tweet would go on to receive more than 14,000 likes. And in response to someone questioning the maturity of young women, John replied with, what's shallow about liking younger women? In contrast to this, one of John's final posts on Twitter would come in the form of a retweet. On January the 10th, he retweeted, my girl swear she not like these other bitches. I unlock your phone den. Back at home, Valentina's family were happy to hear the news. They seemed to like the wealthy American investor, and believed that he could provide a good life for her. And so, at the beginning of 2023, John left his home state and previous family behind to start a new life with his fiancée. He arrived at the airport and rented a Volkswagen before driving to Valentina's family to pick up his bride-to-be. That night, they frequented clubs that Valentina was scheduled to work in. It was noted that, throughout this evening, the two had several drinks together and appeared to have a good time. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and the very next day, the pair began to move Valentina's stuff into their new shared apartment. During this time, she video called her family to give them a virtual tour of the new digs where she was staying. Needless to say, her mother was over the moon for her daughter. After spending so many years helping her mother get on her feet and feel established, Valentina could now finally live her life on her own terms. It was during this time that she was moving her stuff over to the new apartment that she sent a video video message to her mother. But tragically, little did Laura know that this would be the last time that she would hear from Valentina. January the 23rd, 2023. It was expected to be a typical day for the Trespalacio Hidalgo family. Although the family home no longer had Valentina, they were happy to know that she was moving on to bigger and better things. But at 7.45pm that evening, their lives would change forever. Laura Hidalgo received a phone call that no mother should ever receive. The call came from Valentina's manager, Pablo Silva, and he had phoned them with devastating news. Tragically, 
she had been found dead. Earlier that day, a homeless man was rummaging through dumpsters found near the local airport, and in one of those dumpsters, he came across a large blue suitcase. For a homeless person, this could potentially be a gold mine. Anything of value inside could be sold for money to then afford food. Though, upon approaching the suitcase, it didn't seem to be an easy task to get out of the dumpster, as, strangely enough, it was very heavy to pull out from the rest of the rubbish. Something was wrong here. The homeless man began to feel suspicious. The case seemed to remain closed by a thick layer of tape and after cutting it open, it was immediately apparent that there was something very large inside. The man could see a white garbage bag inside the case, and, even more worrying, bloodstains could be seen through the plastic. Not wanting to get involved in anything serious, the homeless man alerted the authorities immediately. The crime scene was cordoned off as officers began to investigate, and upon further investigation, they realized that there was a body inside. Not only that, but it belonged to Valentina Traspalacios. As forensic teams looked further afar, they realized that something else had been left in the dumpster. Inside, they found a small black box containing various items, this including Valentina's school ID and paper ID. The discovery of such personal items was quite out of the ordinary. Usually, the killer will try and hide the identity of the body, so, in this instance, he had clearly missed a trick. Perhaps they had no idea that a homeless person would end up sifting through this garbage, and had hoped that the body would just disappear under landfill. I mean, who knows? Maybe her murderer would have to be someone who was unfamiliar with Columbia's way of life. The cause of Valentina's death was deemed to be strangulation and blunt force trauma. Her neck was marked and bruised and further bruising was found on her face and forearms. Abrasions were even found inside her mouth, showing the sheer brutality of the attack, and since she was found in her nightgown, experts believe that she was attacked while she slept. Among the many items found inside the box was Valentina's mobile phone, and upon checking it, officers realized that she had dozens of missed calls from her manager, Pablo Silva. When officials contacted him, he spoke of how Valentina hadn't spoke to him for more than 24 hours, which was highly out of character for the young woman. Based on the information that he provided, Pablo was not a suspect in the murder of Valentina. Instead, he provided information on who may be involved, that of course being 34-year-old John Poulos. Following his discussion with officers, Pablo made the phone call to her mother, Laura, and of course, that is how they found out. With a named suspect, police were now officially on the lookout for John Poulos, and with her recently moving into a shared apartment with him, it made sense to begin the investigation there. Since their apartment was both new and modern, the apartment complex was equipped with many surveillance cameras, and let me tell you, they revealed some very harrowing details. Surveillance cameras initially captured John entering the apartment alone with a blue suitcase. It is worth noting that he could quickly move the suitcase at this point, and there was no heaviness behind it. He is then seen heading out to meet Valentina shortly after this. As expected, he and Valentina are then seen entering the apartment hours later. Valentina brought a lot of stuff with her, indicating that she had planned to stay at John's for an extended period of time. The pair would come and go from the apartment on numerous times. On January the 21st, the day before her body was found, the couple were seen heading to one of Valentina's gigs. A surveillance camera captured them entering the club together, hand in hand. As the night developed, John joined Valentina in the booth, only to get seemingly jealous of the attention that she was receiving from other people. They are then seen returning home in the early morning hours during sunrise. Several hours later, surveillance camera spotted John once again. However, this time, he was alone. As he left the apartment, he could be seen ferrying the blue suitcase in a trolley. The manner in which he now moves the suitcase suggests that it is either broken or too heavy to carry. Another camera in the basement captures him slyly looking around the car park, before shifting the suitcase into the car. He is then seen struggling with the weight of it, 
further indicating that something heavy must be inside. After leaving the parking lot, surveillance cameras tracked John's car on various streets in Bogota, leading to the Fontabon area, where Valentina's body was eventually discovered. Quite notably, this region is near El Dorado International Airport, leaving room for speculation about John's intentions afterwards. With Valentina's murder gaining national attention and authorities alerted to their prime suspect, the public was on high alert for John Pulos. Concerningly, further investigations revealed that shortly after committing the crime, he did manage to board a flight to Panama. Now, the dense rainforest terrain between Colombia and Panama makes it almost impossible to drive between, with minimal or no mapped roads available for travel between the two countries. Panama International Airport serves as an international hub for hundreds of flights daily, so authorities knew that they had to move fast. And after contacting Panama Airport, it was discovered that John had already booked a flight to Sao Paulo, Brazil. However, a second and booking through Turkish Airlines to Istanbul suggested an attempt to mislead authorities, a tactic made by John that would prove to be unsuccessful. In a dramatic altercation, armed officers stormed the gate that John was set to depart from. He was arrested on the spot, only moments before his flight was scheduled to begin boarding. And of course, in the process, the authorities left enough time for bystanders to take some pretty badass shots of them leading John out of the airport. During his apprehension, authorities noticed a large cut on his temple, resembling a scratch that a human nail could have made. So, as it turns out, John had meticulously meticulously thought out his escape plan, and predictably, the aircraft that he was trying to board was the international flight to Istanbul. Now, if he had arrived in Istanbul, he would have then boarded a flight to Montenegro, a European country with no extradition treaty with Colombia. In short, John planned on running away without any legal hooks back to Valentina. To make his escape plan less traceable, he purchased all plane tickets with cash. But it's kind of redundant if you then must include your passport details. In a last-ditch effort to evade prosecution, John falsely claimed that he was fleeing from the Medellin cartel, alleging that they were responsible for Valentina's murder and were now on the lookout for him too. But somewhat convinced by this story, the authorities dismissed it entirely. And just one day after his capture, John Pelos was extradited to Colombia to face trial. Moving into the legal proceedings of this case, John's defense team would try to delay the trial by citing many issues with his language barrier. And although his trial was due to take place in April of 2023, his defense lawyers claimed that he did not receive adequate translation while in custody or first court appearances. They also claimed that since femicide criminal charges don't exist in the United States, John did not understand what he was being accused of which sounds bloody baloney to you and me. Now, of course, the US does actively charge and convict men who murder women, but since femicide isn't technically written into US law, his defense lawyers tried to use this to his advantage. Obviously, the prosecution would not listen to these wild claims, and furthermore, they said they had enough evidence to prove that he was well advised in English. But believe it or not, these claims would be successful in delaying his trial, pushing it back by several months. During this period, Various aspects of John's personal life were put into the public spotlight. It was discovered that he frequented various adult and sugar baby websites under the alias Lord of Magic. While there, he spent thousands of dollars in an attempt to garner affection. Even worse, this money was most likely stolen from his previous family. It is worth noting that Valentina was not found on these websites, but rather through Instagram. Be very careful who slides in to your DMs, folks. While John awaited trial in custody, he asserted a profound fear of being assassinated by the cartel, and further requested complete isolation for his safety until the final trial. Simultaneously, his defense team diligently worked to stop the trial from progressing, leveraging several international laws in their favor. They argued that John lacked comprehension of the charges, and even tried to claim that Valentina left the apartment complex after 
after an argument. Throughout the weeks and then months, his story kept changing, and it seemed that nothing John or his defense said could be taken seriously or as truthful. All of this turbulence in the trial means that we don't actually have a verdict as of yet, but if found guilty, John could face up to 60 years behind bars. This of course being determined by Columbia's laws against femicide and concealment of evidence. Despite this, John still refuses to accept any accountability. At a hearing in September of this year, he said, I am not going to accept the charges and I maintain my innocence. On the other hand, the prosecution claims that all of this was premeditated, spurred by jealousy and initiated after he learned of Valentina's infidelity. Now, there are various details that I haven't told you yet which scream premeditation. I mean, for example, did you know that both his car and his apartment were only contracted to be rented for four days? This highly suggests that John had concocted an elaborate plan to lure Valentina in confront her about her alleged infidelity, and then murder her in cold blood. Toxic emotions of revenge and jealousy danced with methodical callousness, and in the end, we were left with the classic case of, if I can't have her, nobody can. Now, John's fate is yet to be determined, but given all of the evidence against him, I think it is safe to say that he is not in a good position. Not to forget his pattern of abusing his ex-wife and quite literally leaving his family high and dry. Quite honestly, this man sounds like a monster through and through. John has already proved himself selfish with no moral compass. Couple this with jealousy and insecurity, and you can see how he has the potential to be so dangerous. We can only hope that Valentina's family and friends get the justice they so desperately deserve. But yeah, only time will tell for that one. Valentina was taken from this world far too soon. She was beautiful, popular, ambitious, and very successful. Each of these characteristics influenced the other, and so it's no wonder she became such an unstoppable storm of a woman. Successful people often attract monsters, it is a well-known fact, and sadly, she unknowingly opened the door to this jealous, problematic, rotten man. Valentina's family are absolutely devastated by the loss of their loved one. In a press conference, her mother said, My daughter had big dreams, including including becoming a DJ, traveling the world, and exploring many countries. She wanted to collect stamps on her passport, and create a foundation to help vulnerable animals. Her dreams were numerous and noble. She cared deeply for her grandparents, and wanted to help them in their life as they had been failed by their own parents. My daughter had many dreams, and did not deserve to die. This sentiment resonates among Valentina's family. She was a devoted individual who cherished her mother, brother, sisters, and grandparents. She would have done anything to help them, and had so much potential ahead of her. Her zest for life was unmistakable, but tragically, it was extinguished by a self-centered individual fixated solely on the superficial allure of money and beauty, callously discarding the profound sentimental value that Valentina held dear. May those who recall Valentina do so, not through the lens of her tragic demise, but by celebrating the vibrant life that she led with her ambitious dreams. Looking ahead, one can only hope that a killer feels the full weight of the law, ensuring that he remains removed from society for the remainder of his days. As always folks, I'll keep you updated once the trial concludes. Speaking of which, we are overdue an update video on Coffeehouse Crime. That'll probably come out in about one or two months time, and it's just one of many new things coming to the channel. Anyway folks, let me know what you think about this case, because to me, it is quite clear that John Poulos is guilty. But what do you think? As always, let me know in the comment section down below. And thank you so much for making it this far in the video, I really do appreciate it. Remember, if you'd like a bag of coffee for half the price, go to classifiedcoffeeco.com and use the code SAVE50 at checkout. I've got lots of extra things coming over at my Patreon which you can visit here, and if you want to be part of the deeper coffee house crime community, visit my Instagram here. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this video folks. As always, I'll see you again very soon for another video, and thank you so much for making it this far. Please remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.